بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله All praises due to Allah and may the salutations and peace be upon his messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم We begin with Allah's name asking him to bless our meeting and to make it something that we all benefit from today and most importantly to make this a sincere effort to clarify a few things and to guide all of us inshallah those who are everyday muslims going to work taking care of their families every now and then they will go and they will pull up a video on youtube or pull up an mp3 file just to listen to some scholars of islam in order to to learn their religion and live as muslims because we know that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the exalted the transcendent allah has told us in the Quran about one thing that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told to ask Allah more of. The only thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to ask more of is knowledge. وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا And say, my Lord increase me in knowledge. And this is a very important thing. And the reason for that is because with knowledge, you can attain the khashya of Allah. Khashya. Now in Arabic, we have two words. We have khashya and we have khawf. And both of them are translated as fear, but the Arabic language is a lot more deep than that. And there's much, much more to it than just fear. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَى اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, إِنَّمَا يَخَافَ اللَّهَ, يخاف الله مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ He said, يَخْشَى اللَّهَ يَخْشَى Khashya in Arabic is having a reverence and a fear with knowledge. Not just, oh, I'm scared, the snake is going to bite me. Or uh, fearing Allah is not like that. Fearing Allah is, is an element, there's an element of love in there, there's an element of respect, and there's also an element of fearing his punishment. So knowledge is a very important thing for us Muslims today, especially given the, the, the topic that uh, we're discussing today. It's, it's one of those things, to be honest, which I uh, personally avoid doing. I don't like to uh, speak about anybody in particular. Usually those of us who have been keeping up with me on, on Facebook, which is my only uh, outlet for da'wah, for calling to Islam and calling to Allah. I, if I refute or if I uh, you know, speak about anybody or any mistakes, I do it indirectly. And a lot of you have noticed that. In fact, this is my approach. Is I'm very indirect. Muhammad Sallallahu when he was correcting people, you know, he would say, ما بال What is it with some people who do this? But our scholars have also pointed out that when you have people that are calling to misguidance, when you have people that are calling and making these really strange conclusions due to their own uh, academia or whatever the case might be, then it is incumbent upon those who have some, who have been given some knowledge. You know, one of Allah's favors upon me is that I have a little bit that I can share with you and I just share with whatever I have. And frankly speaking, and I'm gonna be this open about this, the, the first time I, I, I came on Facebook, to be honest, the main reason or the only reason at that time I came on Facebook was because I started studying with the International Open University, which formerly was uh, called the Islamic Online University. Still the same university uh, established by Dr. Bilal Phillips, Hafizahullah, may Allah preserve him, and the entire team that's working with him to help maintain this university. I joined IOU, that's the abbreviation, in March of 2015. And then I was so excited about what I was learning and felt so excited about it that I said, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna join Facebook. I'm gonna join Facebook and I'm gonna, you know, start to share what I what I'm what I'm learning from, from this university. And so I joined Facebook around November, I think it was end of November 2015. And since then I've been on there only for this reason. Um, sometimes I will share a few things here and there just to let you know that I am a human being like you. I'm not just some a uh, strange person who just types it things and puts them on Facebook and then that's it. No, we're all human beings. We all have emotions. We have our problems. You know, we have our issues. No one is, uh, you know, free from that. So brothers and sisters, and even the non-Muslims who are brothers and sisters in humanity, if you're watching, if any of you are watching, one of the most important tenets of our faith of Islam, one of the things that we pride ourselves as Muslims in is that everything we have in our religion, all of our primary sources, starting with the Quran, which is Allah's word verbatim, literal word of Allah, the Quran, and the tradition, the instructions, the teachings of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, these are both our primary sources, and we get these through chains of transmission. We get these through what? Chains of transmission, meaning we know exactly who heard this narrative, 
instruction, whatever it might be. We know exactly who heard it from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or from another one of the companions who were around Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, passed it down to their students and then the students passed it down to other students and, and like that. In Islam, we have volumes of books, volumes, scholars have written volumes of books on all the personalities, everybody who's narrated through a chain of transmission all the way back to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These individuals who did the narrations, we know when they were born, we know who their teachers were, we know where they traveled, we know who they encountered. We know if, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> when they reached old age, if they started to forget, all these details are there. If they had, a, 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 if they leaned towards one of the deviant groups, for example, like that. So we have all this information. We have that wealth of information. No other religion, no other anything, ideology, whatever you want to call it, can trace back the teachings and the primary sources of its ideology back to its quote unquote founder, if you want to call that for now like that the way that Islam has. So today's discussion is about none other than Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our prophet, the best human being to walk the earth, the best one that ever walked the earth and the best that there ever will be to walk the earth, the best of all creation, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And also our mothers, the mothers of the believers, Ummahat al Mu'mineen. One of them, Zainab bint Jahsh, may Allah be pleased with her, one of his wives, we're going to be talking today about what happened as far as him marrying her and the details of that story. Unfortunately, we have today the celebrity speaker pop culture, and I'm going to be up front today, and I'm not going to be apologetic in any way. I'm just going to say it how it is. Dr. Yasser Qadi, may Allah guide him back to what he learned back in Medina, the pre-Yale University. Yasser Qadi, Abu Ammar, may Allah guide him back to what he was because he learned a lot of great things from that university. And he wrote a thesis in the university about al jahm ibn Safwan and how, and I haven't read that thesis yet. I have a copy of it in Arabic and I'm going to read it inshallah. He showed all the different deviant groups, the different deviant sects and how they got their ideologies from this personality, Jahm ibn Safwan and how Jahm ibn Safwan ruined, well, he distorted the teachings when it came to the Islamic creed, when it comes to things like the names and attributes of Allah. And when it comes to things like Qadr, predestination, and things like that. So he showed how the Mu'tazila, the Ash'ara, the Maturidiya, and all those other groups that came after the generation of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. He showed how they all trace it back, for the most part, to that person who learned it from Ja'd ibn Dirham, and the story goes on like that. So we ask Allah, first of all, to guide him back. And I, my message today is not for Yasir Qadi. I'm going to make this absolutely clear right now. If he listens to me, I don't think he will listen to me. And I'm not really uh, an important person in his world. I'm not even on his radar. Not that it matters. My concern is the people that listen to him. Because when you have somebody in that kind of level of popularity, and you know people are looking up to him as Dr. Yasir Qadi, you know, he, he studied in Saudi Arabia, and this is the place where the proper creed is taught and the best Islamic creed is taught, which is what it is. And that's, this is a fact. And then he went on to study in Yale and then, you know, did his thesis and all this other, he's a doctor. He, he's, he's up there at that level. Now, one of the sisters who follows my Facebook page brought to my attention a lecture that Yasir Qadi did. This lecture that Yasir Qadi did was on Zainab bint Jahsh. May Allah be pleased with her and how Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married her and the whole, you know, and the whole story behind all that. And since she brought this up to me, I've been very, very busy. I put everything aside. And when I say I put everything aside, I literally mean what I said. I put every single thing aside. Right now, I'm in the middle of trying to turn my master's thesis into a book. I did a refutation of Hizb al-Tahrir. And uh, the thesis, you know, itself was about 65 thousand words and I'm trying to clean it up and add more things to it and, and, and it's a lot of work. So I'm, I'm trying to work on that and I have other things I'm working on. Uh, being an alumni with the International Open University, I'm trying to help them with curriculum and things like that. So there's a lot of work to be done that I'm working on. And brothers and sisters, uh, refutations, when you refute somebody, uh, it's very important to make sure that you are sure of what that person said. And today with the social media and the online world, it's not very difficult to find that information out. I didn't take slices or splices of the lecture he did, which was part 12. If you can look it up online, it's, it's there. Part 12 of his series on the mothers of the believers uploaded last August on Zainab bin Tajash. And the, if I'm not wrong, the, um, in the lecture itself, it starts, I'm just gonna 
um, double check one more time just to give you the accurate information. The lecture itself begins you know, it's a, it's a long lecture. It's about an hour and 25 minutes or so. It's not very short, but he starts at about 21 minutes. Yeah, he starts at about 21 minutes talking about what he's talking about with respect to Zainab bint Jahsh. And he ends at about 55 minutes or so. And then at the end of the lecture, there's a Q and A, he would question and answer and they ask him what that same thing again. Yes, the Qadi believes that the verse in the Quran in Surah Al-Ahzab, that is chapter 33, verse 37, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about that he will reveal what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has kept hidden in his heart, that what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hid in his heart was what? Not that he hid that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala already told him before, which Allah did previously in a revelation, which wasn't revealed in the Quran. He had information that he will eventually marry Zainab bin Tujahsh. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala told this to him. So Yasir Khalid doesn't believe that it was the knowledge or he claims that, well, you know, you can reconcile that story with the story that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he was really hiding in his heart, was what? His love for Zainab. And Yasir Qadi went on to bring narrations and um, claims that this is what the original story was and that over the history of Islam, the scholars, quote unquote, sanitized, sanitized the story. That's why this lecture that I have today, I called it Yasir Qadi polemics, to sanitize or not to sanitize. You know, we use these catchy phrases not to make fun of somebody, not to put them down but to attract the attention of those who listen to that person so that they can actually get an opportunity to really have a chance to evaluate this, these claims. In the last couple of days, or the, actually in the last day or so, I, um, I mentioned that I'd prepared a PowerPoint presentation and uh, this took me a very long time to do. Alhamdulillah, I managed to get through it and I believe I covered everything I have to cover. But I wanna tell you something about the PowerPoint. Obviously PowerPoints, for those of us who know when you go to school, PowerPoint presentations give a brief point form analysis of what we're studying. PowerPoint presentations are not meant to replace the actual content of the lecture or the talk. Today, I'm gonna to try my best to keep it as, as brief as I can, but I think that the, the topic is so important that today's objectives, number one, is to talk about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his wife Zainab bin Tujahsh. I'm here to academically, first and foremost, academically defend their honor because we have Yasir Qadi saying that, oh, the scholars of Islam, they, they sanitized. You know, they sanitize the story. When you sanitize something, what does that mean? It wasn't clean to begin with. How can you use that term sanitize on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's marriage to Zainab? What are you implying with that word? Even if you weren't implying that, anything negative with it. To me, it was a very poor choice of words. Just like the same poor choice of words when Yasir Qadi said about the Islamic penal code that is bizarre and problematic. Very bad choice of words. And to try to justify that choice of words by saying, oh, I meant it was mushkil al-hadith. I meant that it was the um, science of hadith where you have apparently, uh, you know, narrations that apparently seem like they're gonna contradict each other, but we try to reconcile them using the sciences of hadith or the narratives of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very poor choice of words. You don't translate mushkil al-hadith with the words problematic and bizarre. Those are very bad, especially when you're talking to a non-Muslim audience. Anyway, we, me and brother Abu Mus'ab Wajdi Akari, may Allah bless him and preserve him. We spoke about that a while ago in our video together. But today, I'm going to share with you the PowerPoints that I've come up with, and we're going to be going over that. And for those of us who, who have the PowerPoints um, already, you know, I will be putting it up on the screen. And anybody who wants those PowerPoints after the lecture, just send me an instant message, and uh, I will gladly share it with you, inshallah. And then you can watch the video again with the PowerPoints in front of you, like you're watching a lecture at school. And I'm very comfortable doing this because um, since 2005, I've been teaching at the college level before studying Islamic sciences and Islamic studies. My major, which still is my, one of my majors, is accounting and economics and business. And um, I'm, I taught you know, business math and all, all kinds of other subjects. So in terms of teaching, I'm very, this is my thing. That's what I do. And so the PowerPoints are designed to make it very easy for you to follow. So without any further delay, so we can get right to the material itself, I'm going to share my uh, screen with you. Bismillah. So this is basically where we're going to start. Now, Yasir Qadi begins his uh, talk by talking about something very awkward and very strange that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was hiding. And to prove this point, he, and this is the thing that I'm going to mention here, he begins this talk with authentic narrations. And I have them right in front of your screen here. Narrations of Anas and Aisha. 
and Anas and Aisha. Okay, now these are in Arabic. The first narration, An Aisha qalat law kana nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam katiman shay'an min al wahi la katama hadhihi al ayah wa it taqulu lil ladhi an'ama Allahu alayhi wa an'amta alayhi. In at Tirmidhi, Sahih, authentic narration in at Tirmidhi, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, the, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She said if the Prophet وسلم, was going to hide anything from the revelation, she, used, she didn't say a Quran, she said revelation, okay? Which is a very general, um, you know, statement. Then he would have kept this verse. Now, the relation could be uh, something in the Hadith or in the Quran. Like we said, revelation comes from two sides. But anyway, let's say that it is talking about the verse because she said another narration right below it in Arabic which is also from Aisha in Sahih Muslim so we have one in Tirmidhi and Sahih Muslim she says the same thing if Muhammad وسلم, was going to hide anything from what was revealed to him he would have hidden this verse and she mentions verse 37 in chapter 33 of the Quran okay fine that's an authentic narration. This is Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her. Now, Anas. May Allah be pleased with him in Sahih al-Bukhari. So you have Sahih Muslim, Sahih al-Bukhari, and at tirmidhi the authentic hadith in that hadith compilation. Okay? He said, Zayd, he said that Zayd came to uh, complain about Zainab. This is obviously when Zainab was the wife of Zayd. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, fear Allah and keep your wife. And then Anas said, if Muhammad, if the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was going to hide anything, he would have hidden this. So, it, you know, he, he said that. And then later on in the same saying or the same hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari um, from Anas ibn Malik again, he said, that Zainab used to boast, used to feel proud over the rest of the wives of the Prophet وسلم, and she used to say that your parents, your guardians, your family are the ones that married you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala married me to Muhammad وسلم, from above, above seven heavens. So she's proud that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that did the marriage contract for her. Allah was, his guard, Allah was her guardian. Now imagine that honor that she had and how how proud she felt of this. So this is the narration that mentions it. And this is a side point. This proves without a shadow of a doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above and beyond his creation. He's not everywhere. If one of the wives of Muhammad sallallahu who is, I mean, who can know more than the wives who are living in the same house as him sallallahu alayhi wa about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the creation. Whether the other groups in Islam like it or not, this is a proof against them and it's a proof for the people of the Sunnah. Now, I'm going to say this. Why was this verse so difficult? What made it so hard? What was so difficult about this verse? What was so difficult about this verse? The Arabs practice a tradition for thousands of years. Imagine something that's been practiced for thousands of years. The adopted son was treated like a biological son, meaning that if you adopted somebody, then that person was like your own biological son as if he was born from a woman that you married. And so that marrying the ex-wife of the adopted son was the same as marrying the wife of, or the ex-wife of the biological son. So obviously we know that in Islam, like you, if, 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 I, if I have a son and he married a woman, this woman that my, my, my biological son married, right? Becomes like my own daughter. I'm prohibited to marry her. I become like her father. So here, the Arabs, back in their own traditions for thousands of years, they had this tradition where if you adopted someone, uh, the, the son, and he married, that you, for you to marry the wife of the adopted son after he divorces her was like, you just don't do that. This is huge. Muhammad وسلم, was already given revelation from Allah that Zayd will divorce Zainab and that Muhammad وسلم, will eventually marry her. This is even before the verse itself. So he had knowledge about this from before. 
And that's why it was so hard on him. Why was this so difficult? Because Zainab, uh, Zainab is his cousin. Zainab is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam's cousin. And in fact, it was him that went to ask for her for Zayd. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked for Zainab to marry Zayd. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he adopted Zayd, he adopted him before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was even a prophet. So before, the, before he was given the revelation, the, the, the message of Islam to be the prophet, he had um, already adopted uh, Zayd and, and so much so that he, and he loved Zayd so much that Zayd was called Zayd ibn Muhammad. Imagine to that point. So why was this going to be difficult? Now look, the Quran itself, when it comes to explaining the Quran, the scholars of Islam tell us the first way to explain the Quran is by the Quran. Because the Quran is authentic and it explains itself. And there are no contradictions in the Quran. And the authentic Sunnah, that is the sayings of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they also don't contradict the Quran. Okay? This is a fact and this is the belief that we have as Muslims, period. The first verse and what translates as meaning, this is the first verse of Surah Al-Ahzab. Okay? O Prophet, fear Allah and do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Indeed, Allah is ever knowing and wise. If you look at the first few verses of this chapter in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet sallam, there are things that are gonna happen. You're gonna have a problem. The disbelievers and the hypocrites are gonna have a problem with that thing. And so what? Do not worry about them, have dependence on Allah and disregard what they say. So Zainab, is his cousin, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Zayd ibn Muhammad, as he was called before, was his beloved, Hibb al Rasuli, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it was also going to be difficult for, for the reason that these two are so close to him. And the third reason is that it was going to be difficult because it was going to cause a major change in customs and the disbelievers and the hypocrites will take that as an opportunity to take what? To take jabs at Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah al Qadi starts by, by, by quoting these authentic narrations and then he gets into other narrations, which, you know, before uh, being told about his lecture, I never even paid attention to this, nor did I even think about it. All, I always knew that it was because uh, it was gonna be a major culture shock for the Arabs. But then what does uh, Yasir al Qadi do? Again, he starts with an authentic narration. And I'm gonna relate to this point later on. He starts with Bukhari, he goes, it's in Bukhari. This is the same hadith, by the way, on the first slide. Well, the second slide after the title page. You know, if I take you back real quick, here. You know, this, this hadith here in Sahih al-Bukhari, the one I'm pointing at, this one, okay? This one here, he starts with it. And I titled this next five slides, was it love for Zainab? What does this say? Now look, please pay very close attention to the chain of transmitters. And I want you to be patient with me. This is not gonna be complicated. I've made it as simple as I could to the point where I even color coded the names in the uh, chain, of, chain of narration. Now, the first thing we're gonna do is talk about the chain of transmission. And it says the Sanad or the chain of transmission from Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al Muqaddimi. I put that in green. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al Muqaddimi. Okay, I use the green color for his name in Arabic and English. From Hamad ibn Zayd. I put his name in what? In purple. Hamad ibn Zayd's name is in purple. Okay, again, please pay attention. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al Muqaddimi in green. From Ham this is the low part of the chain. Now we're going to move up the chain to the companions. From Hamad ibn Zayd. From Thabit. Thabit is in the blue color. From Anas. Anas is in red, in the red color. Okay? So, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr 
Al Muqaddimi narrates from Hamad ibn Zayd, who narrates from Thabit, who narrates from Anas. What does Anas say? This is the same hadith I told you about in the beginning. Zayd ibn Haritha came to the Prophet complaining about his wife, Zainab. The Prophet kept on saying to him, Be afraid of Allah and keep your wife. And said, If Allah's Messenger, now Anas said, If Allah's Messenger were to conceal anything of the Quran, he would have concealed this verse. And then he mentioned the verse. And he said that Zainab used to boast before the wives of the Prophet to the end of the hadith that we've already mentioned. Okay? This is authentic. You know, Muhammad ibn uh, Abi Bakr al-Muqaddimi, one of the students of Hamad ibn Zayd, because Hamad ibn Zayd was teaching Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Muqaddimi. So the, the one in purple taught the one in green. Okay? And then the one in purple took from the one in blue, from Thabit, from Anas. That's authentic. That's in Bukhari. Now, where do you get in this authentic narration, let alone the Quran, the Quran itself, the verses which I'll get to later on? Where do you get that Muhammad Sallallahu was hiding his love for Zainab? Honestly, I cannot see where that comes from. Next slide. Yasir Qadi starts his claim that Muhammad Sallallahu loved Zainab with this next narration that he gets from Musnad Ahmad. Okay. Ahmad ibn Hanbal has his own compilation of hadith. Now, the narration I gave in the previous slide, right? Remember, let's go back quickly. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Muqaddimi from Hamad ibn Zayd, from Thabit, from Anas. Okay? Now, we're going to drop Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Muqaddimi, the one in green, we're going to drop him. Hamad ibn Zayd, the one in the purple, he had nine students. One of those students... His name is Mu'ammal ibn Ismail, right here. And I put his name in gray. Okay? The same narration was transmitted from nine students of Hamad ibn Zayd. Okay? Including, including the one in green over here, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Muqaddimi, including him. One of those other nine students is Mu'ammal ibn Ismail. And this was narrated in Musnad Ahmad. And I have it in Arabic. حدثنا مؤمل ابن إسماعيل حدثنا حماد ابن زيد حدثنا ثابت عن أنس قال أتى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم منزل زيد بن حارثة فرأى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم امرأته زينب فكأنه دخله وبعد ذلك ماذا قال مؤمل ابن إسماعيل هذا من كلامه لا أدري من قول حماد أو في الحديث يعني هو غير متأكد فجاء زيد يشكوها إليه فقال له النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أمسك عليك زوجك واتق الله ثم قال فنزلت واتق الله وتخفي في نفسك ما الله مبدي إلى آخر الحديث I want you to pay very close attention to this and really focus with me look at the chain of, of transmission that I have here that I'm highlighting for you okay in the previous slide I had in green, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Muqaddimi, right? From Hamad ibn Zayd, from Thabit, from Anas. Look over here now. I dropped the one in the green, the previous one. Now, Hamad ibn Zayd in the purple is still the same. That's the teacher of Muhammad ibn Ismail. Just like he was the, he's the teacher of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Muqaddimi. This is another student of Hamad ibn Zayd. So Mu'amal ibn Ismail, another student of Hamad ibn Zayd, narrates from his teacher, Hamad ibn Zayd, from Thabit, from Anas, who said, look, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam came to Zayd ibn Haritha's place. He came to his house. And then it says, and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam saw his wife Zainab, and he almost entered upon him. Now I'll explain to you what, what, what that is, meaning the house, we'll, we'll see. Now, Mu'amal ibn Ismail, the same one who narrates this version of the hadith, he himself said, look at this, I'm not sure if it is Hamad's comment or part of the hadith itself. Even Mu'amal ibn Ismail himself, the student of Hamad ibn Zayd, wasn't even sure about what he was saying. He doubted himself. And then he continued on and said, Zayd ibn Haritha came to him complaining, came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa complaining about the wife, about his wife Zainab. And then the Prophet said to him, keep your wife and with you and fear Allah. He said the verse, 
but oh Muhammad, you did hide in your heart that which Allah was about to make manifest up to, and then he said, we gave her into your marriage. And this was, and then Mu'amal ibn Ismail is saying, this was revealed about Zainab. Okay. Very important thing to keep in mind here. Again, I color coded it for you. Green, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Muqaddimi. Here in the previous slide, okay, in slide number five. I replaced him with Mu'amal ibn Ismail. This is another narration from one of the students of Hamad ibn Zayd. He had nine students in total. We had Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Muqaddimi back here in the green. Okay. And we have, instead of him, Mu'amal ibn Ismail. But Hamad ibn Zayd, Thabit and Anas are the exact same three that came before him. Okay. Mu'amal ibn Ismail wasn't even sure about that part of the hadith. In Arabic, it says, this is in red now in the Arabic. What does that mean? And then he said, Hamad, Muhammad ibn Ismail said, I don't even know if it's my, my teacher who said it, if it's the hadith, I don't know. He doesn't know. In Arabic, when it says, Now Zainab is a feminine. And dakhala here is a masculine. Something, and he entered it. He entered. Now it says dakhala entered. Okay. I could easily say that dakhala here, aside from the fact that this hadith is, is, is bogus, and I'm going to explain to you this in a bit. Dakhala here could mean dakhala manzila Zayd. He entered Zayd's house. You could say that. Although in Arabic, when you talk about a verb, it usually refers to the closest noun to it. But we could also say that it could refer to the other now. So in this hadith, look at the bottom of my screen. When Yasir Qadi narrates this hadith, he says it, how he says it. And he says, he saw Zainab and something entered his heart. And there was something in his heart that he did not reveal. Where did it say in this hadith, there was something in his heart that he did not reveal? Okay, maybe that part about something entered, dakhala, the heart is a masculine in Arabic. Maybe it could mean that something entered his heart. Okay, fine. Maybe I'll give you that. But where does it say here that there was something in his heart that he did not reveal? Where'd you get that from? So this hadith, we have another thing at the bottom. Aside from the fact that even Mu'amal ibn Ismail has no idea what he's talking about. The second point says, scholar of hadith, Shaykh Shaib al-Arna'ut. This is a scholar of hadith, by the way, not just some little guy like me concluded that the chain of transmission is weak and the text, even the text of the hadith, forget about the chain, the text of the hadith is strange. He also stated that this guy, Mu'amal ibn Ismail has weak memory, doesn't remember very well. And look at the hadith that says, I don't know if this was Hamad's, my teacher's comments or, or the hadith itself, I don't know, he doesn't remember. And Shaykh Shaib al Arnaut here is saying, yes, he has weak memory. So in addition, a group of other trustworthy narrators, meaning the other students of Hamad ibn Zayd, because we said he has nine students, nine, tis'a, nine students. One of them is the one in the previous slide, we talked about him already, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Muqaddimi, who mentioned that hadith in, uh, as I mentioned in, um, in Bukhari, so it's authentic. Another student is Mu'amal ibn Ismail, that makes two out of nine, there are you know, seven other students. So the other eight, other than Mu'amal, narrated this hadith in a different way. So Muhammad ibn Ismail narrated it by himself in a very strange way that we just see right now. Okay. So in addition, a group of other trustworthy narrators narrated this hadith, but without the phrase, without the phrase, And the messenger of Allah saw his wife Zainab and he almost entered upon the house or entered some, something entered. This phrase was not there in any of the other eight narrations from the other students of Hamad ibn Zayd. So the guy's got weak memory. His narration is strange. Even he's doubting himself. He's got no idea what he's talking about. Okay. And then Shaykh Shaib al Arnaut added that there's another authentic hadith, which we'll get to, by the way, uh, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam later, uh, in, after Zayd divorced Zainab, he instructed Zayd to mention him to Zainab after Zayd had divorced her in a marriage proposal. Now pay attention to this. 
And Shaykh Shu'ib al arnaud says what? And that it was in that hadith in which is the mention of Zayd coming to a house, house of Zainab. So because that one above there with Muhammad ibn Ismail, he entered the house and something entered his heart and whatever. Okay. This is an authentic hadith in which Zayd goes to his ex-wife Zainab when he divorced her and he had no more interest in her at all, period. He went to her to ask for her hand for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Shaykh Shaykh al says, and it was, pay attention, it was in that hadith in which the mention of Zayd coming to the house of Zainab, so he entered the house in that hadith, and he saw, and, and, and he saw, and after he saw her, a sense of respect and reverence entered his heart. Whose heart? The authentic hadith says, Zayd, not Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from some obscure narrator who doesn't know what he's talking about or can't even remember what he said, whether it was the hadith or his teacher. So Dr. Yasu Qadi is telling us, it's in, Musnad, it's in Musnad Ahmad. You know, he's picking up his book and saying, it's right here. You can bring me books that are this high. If it's not authentic, we're not going to take it. So, the, 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 so even though Yasu Qadi started off with authentic narrations, he began with authentic narration. It's a, it's a trick, it's a trap. And then he goes to an inauthentic one to say, see, it's right there. No, this one is rejected. Yes, Al-Qadi, this one's rejected. And in the next slide, what did I do here? I took a screenshot from Musnad Ahmad so that you can say, oh, Wasim typed it. No, no, no. I took a, a screenshot. It's right there in Arabic. Anybody who wants a copy of this PowerPoint, I will gladly give it to you. Message me now, message me later. I will share it with you, inshallah. Now, I want to mention something important. Somebody might think, well, Hadith, some of them are weak, some of them... It says here in the next bullet, early scholars gathered as much as possible about Islamic history. And we're not focusing on authenticity. So you gotta understand something. A lot of the history books in Islam, whether it's Ibn Sa'd's biographies that Yasu Qadi talked about and whatever else, in the early parts of Islam, there was a lot of stuff gathered because they were interested in gathering as much as possible about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about the religion, you know, they, wanted, they didn't wanna miss anything. But it doesn't mean that they said that everything was authentic. So early books of exegesis, meaning tafsir, explaining the Noble Quran, for example, have many fabricated narrations and scholars said this even before. What happened? As history progressed, scholars scrutinized the texts to remove what is inauthentic. Now, if you want more about this hadith that I mentioned now and other weak narrations, go to ikra, icraa.org. I have it at the bottom of the screen. And type Zainab, Z-A-I-N-A-B, in the search bar. And you will find a paper by Sheikh Waqar Akbar Chima. May Allah preserve him and reward him with abundant good. And all the, and the rest of the team on that website, it's an amazing website, which one of the sisters, may Allah bless her. Um, she shared this. I would have never, never known about this unless she, the sister told me about it. May Allah bless her. You want to know about this hadith and all the other hadith that talk about this, you'll find that they contradict each other. And the weakness in these hadiths make them even more weak. See, sometimes you have hadiths which are, this one is weak, this one is weak, but then you have five, seven of them, six, they strengthen each other. Not all the time. Because if you have weak, weak narrations which contradict each other, where the, where the people that are narrating are narrating from hearsay, they have no idea what they're talking about, and they came later, and they don't even tell you where, the, where they got this, this thing from, that makes them even more weak. And that's what happened here. So if you want something more technical, I encourage you to go to that and to get into it. Next slide. So the first thing Yusuf Qadi used was in Bukhari, which we said has nothing to do with the Rasul Muhammad Sallallahu having something in his heart. Forget about that. Then he uses Musnad Ahmad and we show that that, that um, narration is bogus. Next thing that he used, he was talking about At-Tabaqat uh, Al-Kabir Ibn Sa'd. Biographi biographical literature of Ibn Sa'd. It's called Kitab al-Tabaqat al-Kabir, which is Tabaqat is the biographies and so on. And yes, Yasir Qadi, we found this. We found this. In fact, I found it on Islam Ar Archive and it's in the 10th volume. And it's hadith number, quote unquote, hadith number 9745. I'm going to read it in Arabic, just the first part to save time. Akhbarana Muhammad ibn Umar. قال حدثني عبد الله بن عامر الأسلمي عن محمد ابن يحيى ابن حبان قال and then the rest of it. So yes, Qadi was talking about the one in Nusrat Ahmad earlier. Is like, oh, there's a more detailed one coming up in uh, in uh, Tabaqat ibn Sa'd, and I'm going to give you that one with more detail. 
So the first of all, the one of Muslim Ahmad, forget about that one. Let's see this one here. Okay, I put in the red borders around um, uh, the names. First of all, it says, now Ibn Sa'd is saying, Akhbarana. Ibn Sa'd was told by who? Muhammad ibn Umar. Muhammad, sorry, yeah, Muhammad ibn Umar. In fact, I, I found this full name in English. I have Muhammad ibn Umar al-Waqidi. Then he said that Muhammad ibn Umar al-Waqidi, and now Ibn Sa'd is down here. He says, Muhammad ibn Umar al-Waqidi told me that Abdullah ibn Amr told him that Muhammad ibn Yahya ibn Habban told him. Okay. Let's talk about these three. Now, Ibn Sa'd, I'm not going to talk about him. He's a historian. You know, he gathered as much as he could out of his love for Islam. He gathered as much stuff as he can. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. You know, he, no, he needs no introduction. Fath al-Bari, the, 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 the best commentary on hadith, on, on the most authentic books of hadith, which is al-Bukhari, is his book, is his volumes. He has a book called Taqrib at Tahdeeb. And like I said in the beginning of today's talk, you have uh, volumes and volumes of books written by a lot of scholars about the biographies of all these narrators. What does he say? Muhammad ibn Umar al-Waqidi. This is the one that Ibn Sa'd took from. Muhammad ibn Umar al-Waqidi has been declared as what? Matruk. Yikes. Matruk is one of the worst titles you can say about anybody who narrates hadith. What does Matruk mean? It means abandoned. Matruko, leave him. That is, he tells lies and or makes up heresies. So Ibn Sa'd took from somebody who was completely out there. Now, that Muhammad ibn Amr al-Waqidi who was completely out there took from Abdullah ibn Amr, who was weak. And Abdullah ibn Amr, who was weak took from Muhammad ibn Yahya ibn Habban. Muhammad ibn Yahya ibn Habban narrates from the generation of the successors, the Tabi'un, who came after the companions, not from the companions, not just that, Muhammad ibn Yahya ibn Habban didn't even hear it from any companion. He just said, it says, يقال. he said, how do you know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Zayd al Haritha's uh, house and uh, he saw Zainab, you know, without her head cover or not dressed properly, whatever the case might be. How did Muhammad ibn Yahya ibn Habban know this? He doesn't even tell us which companion he heard it from. He doesn't, none of this stuff. He didn't go to Aisha who said, oh, you know, if there was something that Muhammad sallallahu was going to hide it, well, it be this verse. Did he go to Aisha and say, hey, Aisha, is it, uh, is there this love for Zainab? What, is, what was he hiding? It wasn't nothing like that. He did not even mention from whom he heard it. So Ibn Sa'd takes from somebody who's matruk, the Matruk, who's not even to begin with, like, you, you know, you can cut the plug from there if you want. The Matruk took from Abdullah ibn Amr, who's weak. And then Abdullah ibn Amr, who's weak, takes from somebody who takes from the generation of the Tabi'un, the successors, the second generation after Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who took from them. And that person in the, in the generation of the successors doesn't even tell you where he gets it from. Other scholars have taken this narration. Now, by the way, this weak narration, because he's saying, oh, it's in uh, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, it's here, it's everywhere. Yeah, because they took from the same wrong source. Other scholars have taken this very narration of Ibn Sa'd to explain the verse in Quran 33-37, Al-Ahzab, verse 37, such as Ibn Jarir al-Tabari in his, in his history, in his tarikh, which is called the history of the prophets and kings. So Yasir yes, Qadi calls this version A. So he takes Musnad Ahmad, which we said is already out. Now version A. He said, this is version eight. And then what does he do? He takes this narration here. And I'll read it to you. This is in Sahih Muslim. Again, in the context of him saying, it must, this awkward thing that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is hiding is his love for Zainab, you know. It's his love for Zainab. Allah al-Musta'an, may Allah grant us understanding and, and assist us and help us. It says, Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, reported. When the idda, the waiting period of Zainab was over, because after one's divorce, she has to wait a certain period of time. Allah's Messenger وسلم, set to Zayd to make a mention to her about him. So go, we told Zayd, go and propose to Zainab for me on my behalf. Zayd went on until he came to her and she was fermenting her flour. She was working on the mill 
fermenting her flour. Zaid said, I saw her and I felt in my heart an idea of her greatness, so much so that I could not look at her. Remember this hadith I mentioned earlier, Sheikh Shaib al Arnaut. Um, I mentioned about him and how he said that that narration in Muslim Ahmed about something entering the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu heart after he entered the house. Pay attention to this now. Pay attention to this. Zaid said, I saw her and I felt in my heart an idea of her greatness, so much so that I could not look at her, simply for the fact that Allah's Messenger وسلم, had made a mention of her. Something entered Zaid's heart. Not Muhammad. وسلم. So I turned my back towards her out of respect and I turned upon my heels. So he sort of turned back and moved away out of respect because now Muhammad, وسلم, this is a potential life for him. So I turned my back and then said, and then and he said, Zainab. Allah's Messenger وسلم, has sent me with a mention of you. Okay, so he went to her house, he entered her house, and something came in his heart. Zaid, not Muhammad. وسلم. She said, I do not do anything until I solicit the will of my Lord. She wants to pray the istikhara prayer. She consults Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So she stood at her place of worship, and the verse of the Quran pertaining to her marriage was revealed. And Allah's Messenger وسلم, came to her without permission. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already, there's no need for a guardian. Uh, uh, witnesses, a marriage contract. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from above seven heavens already gave good care of that. He, the narrator, said, I saw that Allah's messenger served us bread and meat until it was brought daylight. And the people went away, but some persons were, who were busy in conversation stayed in the house after the meal. Allah's messenger وسلم, also went out and I also followed him, that, that is Anas, and he began to visit the apartments of his wives, greeting them. Assalamu alaikum, saying to them. And all of his wives would say, Allah's messenger, how did you find your family? So they're asking him, how, how is Zainab? Look, how, how's everything with her? He, he, the narrator, stated, I do not know whether I had informed him that the people had gone out or he, the Prophet وسلم, informed me about that. So there were people um, sitting, eating, and, and they would eat in the, in the walima or the, 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 the meal. And then they would leave, you know, they, they would come and they would leave. Some, a different group comes, but then some of them wanted to hang out, you know, and they wanted to talk. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would visit his wives, come back so that they kind of get the message and then they left. And then there's a verse in Surah Al-Hazab that talks about, you know, once you eat, intashiru, just, just spread out, go. Because that was hurting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was shy, but Allah is not shy from the truth. This is in Surah Al-Hazab, beautiful story. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he moved on until he entered the apartment and I also went, that is Anas, and wanted to enter the apartment along with him, but he threw a curtain between me and him as the verses pertaining to seclusion in Surah Al-Hazab as well, by the way along, uh, you know, they had been revealed and the people were instructed in what they had been instructed. Um, Ibn Rafi uh, had made this addition in his narration, one of the people in the chain, Ibn Rafi is one of the people that narrated from Anas. Oh, you have believed unto not the Prophet's houses except when leave is given to you for a meal. So don't come in unless the food is ready. Don't, and, you know, and, then not, and then not surely as to wait for his preparation. Don't come early. When they tell you come eat, you come eat. And then to the words, Allah is not shy of telling you the truth. Now, yes, Qadi, what does this have to do with your claim that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had something in his heart for Zainab? Completely unrelated. So this is an authentic narration. He begins with an authentic narration. And then stuffs in between inauthentic narrations. Mustad Ahmad Ibn Sa'ad throws it in between and then ends up with another authentic one. Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari, they don't support your version of the story. Okay. So this was the first part of Yasul Qadi's discussion. And then he goes to version B. What he called version B? Because that's version A, that's the original one. Now, what does Yasul Qadi say? This is after a variety, quoting a variety of early books of the tafsir of the Noble Quran to prove that version A was the correct narrative. Dr. Yasu Qadi brings what he calls version B and then says, version B is not a narration or an incident. What does he say? Oh, it's just a tafsir. It's just a tafsir. Just a tafsir. First of all, the narrations you bring from the hadith and the sunnah and those places, we just saw that they're completely bogus. They have no basis whatsoever. Okay, you might as well call them tabloids. I'm sorry, I'm going to be frank about this right now. Okay, they have no basis whatsoever. You're just taking authentic narrations with unauthentic ones, mixing them together and saying, yeah, see, told you. The Quran is first explained by the Quran. So if it's a tafsir, let's find out why it's a tafsir. Yes, al-Qadi, now here we go. He quotes tafsir al-Baghawi, one of the scholars of tafsir al-Baghawi. And he says, Ibn Abbas is quoted to have said that what the Prophet وسلم, hid, this is about verse 37 in Surah Al-Ahzab, what Ibn Abbas, uh, Ibn Abbas is quoted to have said that, that what the Prophet وسلم, hid, 
was his love for Zainab and Qatada. Iskur Taf said that what the Prophet ﷺ hid was his desire that Zayd divorces her. And I took it right from the tafsir. ibn Abbas, Okay, so let's see. Wow, and he says, Ibn Abbas said this, Ibn Abbas said this. Well, I hate to break it to you, but Ibn Abbas was mentioned in Tafsir al-Baghawi by, by al-Baghawi himself. But al-Baghawi never brought any chain of transmission going from him up to Ibn Abbas. And this is a very important point. Scholars of Tafsir sometimes may say that Ibn Abbas said this or Aqatata said that and so on. However, they should bring or they should add in their tafsir the chain of transmission going from the mufassir or the scholar of tafsir, in this case al-Baghawi, and it should be going back to, in this case, Ibn Abbas or Qatada. And in this case, it clearly shows that al-Baghawi did not give any chain of transmission going back to either Ibn Abbas or Qatada. Now, Qatada, of course, there is another chain elsewhere, which I'll get into, and I will show that in the next slide. And you will see that this particular chain going back to Qatada from Abdul Razak al-Sanani has its own issues. Yes, the Qadi says in red, quote unquote, but then he brings in version B. This is a, now he's talking about the Baghawi. He brings in version B and that is what he had was the knowledge that he would eventually marry her. And then he says, and this is what is going to shift the narrative, 516 Hijra, you know, he's, he's obsessed with this history thing. You know, the history is progressing and the things are changing, ideas are changing. Version B, this interpretation is more befitting and appropriate for the, 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 the Prophet وسلم, or the Ahwal, I'm going to quote him exactly, the Ahwal and the Maqamat of the Anbiya, the statuses of the Prophets, and that's why this is a good interpretation. Yes, Al-Qadi says, notice, why is it a good interpretation? Because it fits my understanding of how the Prophet وسلم, should act. This is what we call the sanitization, cleaning up a dirty story, right? Not because it fits with the Quranic context, not because what? Not because it fits with the Quranic context, really. What does Al Baghawi really say? Al Baghawi attributes version B that Yasir yes, Qadi calls, which is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he was hiding was the knowledge, to who? Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn al Hussein, al Hussein al Shahid, the martyr, who we love from the household of the, 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 the Ahlul Bayt, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So the grandson of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ahlul Bayt, people within the household of the Prophet Sallallahu He was born in the year 38 after Hijra and died 95 after Hijra. So he was born in 659 of the Common Era and died 714. Meaning he was in the early generation of the successors. He was in the generation of At-Tabi'un. Meaning that Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, the grandchild of Ali ibn Abi Talib, was named like his grandfather by his father al Hussein. Okay. This is 450 years before al Baghawi, because now that's what is saying. See, 516 Hijra, you know, now it's starting to change. What do you mean it's starting to change? 450 years before al Baghawi is telling you this is was told in the, in the generation of the successors, the Tabi'un. Not al Baghawi himself just seeing out of his head. What does al we say? And I got an Arabic right there. It says, وَهَذَا هُوَ الْأَوْلَى وَالْأَلْيَقُ بِحَالِ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَهُوْ مُطَابِقٌ لِلْتَلَاوَةِ لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِمَ أَنَّهُ يُبْدِي وَيَظْهُرُ مَا أَخْفَاهَ وَلَمْ يُظْهَرْ غَيْرَ تَزْوِيجِهَا فَمِنْهُ فَقَالْ زَوَّجْنَاكَهَا فَلَوْ كَانَ الَّذِي أَضْمَرَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ مَحَبَّتَهَا أَوْ إِرَادَةُ طَلَاقِهَا لَكَانَ يُظْهِرُ ذَلِكَ لِأَنَّهُ لَا يَجُوزُ أَنْ يُخْبِرَ أَنَّهُ يُظْهِرُهُ ثُمَّ يَكْتُمُهُ فَلَا يُظْهِرُهُ فَدَلَّ عَلَى أَنَّهُ إِنَّمَا عُوتِبَ عَلَى إِخْفَاءِ مَا عَلَمَهُ اللَّهُ أَنَّهَا سَتَكُونُ زَوْجَةً لَهُ Let's see what Al-Baghawi said Because yes, Al-Qadr is saying See, Al-Baghawi is saying it's because of the status of the Prophets not because it fits the Quranic, the, the Quranic narrative What does Al-Baghawi say? I translated it for you and I put the Arabic in case my translation is not good you can verify and that is more proper and suitable for the status of the Prophets Okay, yes, Al-Qadr, so far so good Yeah, he said that and it is consistent with the recitation of the Quran Whoops you didn't tell us about that part. And it is consistent with the recitation of the Quran. Because Allah knew that he will disclose and reveal what he, the Prophet wasallam, concealed. Allah knew. And he did not reveal anything except the mar marrying Zainab to him, the Prophet wasallam. So he said, Allah said, we married her to you. So after Allah is saying that I'm going to reveal what you were hiding in your heart, he said, I'm going to marry her to you. 
or we marry, I married her to you. And so if what the, let's pay attention. And so if what the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam concealed was his love for her or his desire that she be divorced by Zaid, which is another claim that Yasir Khad is making, then that would have been manifest because it cannot be that he, Allah, informs us that he will reveal it. Then he conceals it and not reveal it. So this proves that what he, the Prophet Sallallahu was blamed for was hiding what Allah had made known to him that she will be his wife. The Quran is crystal clear about that. Even if you had no hadith about the, these verses, the Quran explains the Quran perfectly. Allah tells Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm going to reveal, because why? Because when Zayd came to him complaining about Zainab and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to him, uh, you know, fear Allah, hold on to your wife. Allah mentions this in the Quran that you said this to Zayd. You, you told him this, right? But then what? Allah says to him, I'm going to reveal what you're hiding because you, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, knew, as I told you, I told you that you are going to eventually marry uh, 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 Zainab, but you're hiding it in your heart and you're telling Zayd to keep her, even though you knew that this is going to happen. You didn't tell, for example, Zayd to divorce her out of in joining the ma'roof, in joining what is good, Muhammad you know, um, told them to keep her. Some might say, hey, uh, if Muhammad knew about this, what's he trying to hide? Muhammad in more than one place in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about him having a hesitation to say what Allah revealed to him out of, you know, the reaction of the people because he's a human being at the end of the day. He has feelings too, right? Sometimes he becomes sad. Sometimes he gets upset. Sometimes these things happen to him. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, as Al-Baghawi said here, unlike what Yasir Qadi said, because, not because it fits the Quranic context. No, Yasir Qadi, Al-Baghawi said, because it fits the Quranic context that Al-Baghawi chose the tafsir of one of the tabi'un, the grandson of Ali Nadi Talib, who got this, by the way, from Al-Hasan al-Basri, another one of that generation, 450 years even before Al-Baghawi was, was writing this tafsir. Okay? So, clearly, number one, the thing about Ibn Abbas, which al baghawi mentioned, has absolutely no, no chains of transmission, no proof about where he got that from. Okay, just Ibn Abbas said. What do you mean Ibn Abbas said? I could say, uh, you know, Ibn Mas'ud said without anything. And then just because I said that, that's out. And al baghawi here said that it fits the Quranic narrative and it's the tafsir of Ali ibn, ibn Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, the grandchild of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and in the same generation as Al-Hassan al-Basri as well. So he's trying to dismiss version B by saying, oh, it's just the tafsir. The Quran is clear about it. And the proofs that Yasir Qadi used are feeble proofs to begin with, so we can't even look at those proofs. Now let's look at Qatada's narration. Because he says, Qatada, Qatada, the, the student of Ibn Abbas, Yasir Qadi claims an authentic chain from Abdul Razak al Sanani back to Qatada and says, Qatada has what the Prophet وسلم, hid in his heart was the desire that Zayd divorce Zainab in order that he eventually can marry. And that he feared that, that people, what people might say if he commanded Zayd to divorce her. Wait a minute. Look what he says here. The desire that Zayd divorce Zainab and, and in order that he eventually can marry. What Qatada said was the desire that the Prophet Sallallahu divorce Zainab. Nowhere does Qatada say so he eventually can marry. So Ezra Qadi again is adding more things, you know, from his own head. Here's the narration. From Abdul Razak, from Muammar, from Qatada who said, and this is by the way, it is an authentic chain. It goes back to Qatada, but let's find out about Qatada right now. Zayd came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said, Zainab has been rough on, tough on me with her tongue. She had a sharp tongue, but she regretted it right away and she would apologize. May Allah be pleased with her. And I wish to divorce her. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told him, keep your wife to yourself and fear Allah. And I'm underlining here what Qatada said. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, however, wished that he would divorce her, but he also feared what people might say if he ordered him to divorce her. Where in this narration of Qatada does it say, oh, so you can marry her? Why do you add things from your head like this? Read the narration as feeble as it is from your own, from exactly word for word. So Allah revealed the Noble Quran, 33, 37, to the end of the verse. Qatada explained, when Zayd divorced her, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Zawajnaka. Number one. Okay, first of all, yes, the Qadr is saying, um, was the desire that Zayd divorce Zainab in order that he eventually can marry. Qatada didn't say, so if she can marry, he just said the desire to divorce and the fear of what people might say. Because again, you're breaking a cultural, uh, a, a, a cultural norm here, a major cultural norm. Qatada, number one, did not narrate this from a companion. Therefore, it is what we call mursal, meaning he jumped a companion. He didn't even tell us where he got it from. 
Again, same problem as before. Even though it goes back to Qatada, it's authentic. But who is Qatada? Yeah, Sunnah ibn Abbas. Okay, fine. In his book, Al Mufassal of Al ala Shubhati Ada al Islam, which translates to the detailed response in answering the doubts of the enemies of Islam, a book written about answering the doubts of who? Enemies of Islam. Shaykh Ali ibn Naif al Shahud explains that Qatada's explanation of the Noble Quran, like his explanations in general, by the way, in general, of the Noble Quran, are to be critically examined. And regarding what he narrates, the scholars of Islam notice the excessive tadlis. What does tadlis mean in hadith sciences? It is where someone narrates from his shaykh, but he did not hear it directly from him. So he says, hadathana, so-and-so. Someone son told us, even though he never heard it from his shaykh. Maybe, maybe um, he heard it indirectly, but see in hadith sciences, if you say hadathana, it means you heard directly from the shaykh himself. You can't say from him, no, no, you heard. So sometimes what Qatada will do is says, this person told me, even though he never told them. It might be true, but he never told them directly. And in hadith sciences, that's, that's a no-no. You don't, you, you don't do that. Or he is falsely reporting that he has heard from his shaykh, but in fact, he has not heard it from him. So scholars made it a condition that Qatada presents the full chain of transmission. And even then, even if he gives the full chain of transmission, it is to be examined. And if no chain of transmission is given, or it's missing links like the one above, it's missing a link, then it is really weak, just as in the above narration. So here's your narration of Qatada. Qatada himself, he gives us a Mursal narration. So he doesn't even tell us which companion, which, you know, did he hear from Aisha, you know, because she said something. If Muhammad was to hide anything, it would have been this. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. Okay. So it's Mursal, it's missing a link. Qatada himself, is to be looked upon it very critically, even if you present the full chain of transmission, it's to be critically examined, okay? And if it's missing links, then forget about it. And then Shaykh Ibn Ali, Ali Ibn Nayef al-Shahud quotes from Ibn Hajar's, again, the same book earlier that we talked about, Taqrib al-Tahdib, that as shabi dubbed Qatada as one who collects firewood in the dark, Hatib al-Layl, which means what? Somebody who collects wood in the dark, he didn't even tell if it's a piece of wood or a snake. So if the snake bites him, he's done. And he has no idea what he's collecting. No idea what he's collecting. Meaning he does not know if he puts his hand on a piece of wood or a snake and is thus killed by a snake. We're not talking about the student of Ibn Abbas. We're not talking about Mujahid, who was one of the senior tabi'un, the successors. So, well, Mujahid, for example, was somebody who Ahmad ibn Hanbal said, if you get the tafsir, the explanation of the Quran from Mujahid, then put everything else aside because it's reliable. Mujahid is the one that used to stop Ibn Abbas at every verse to ask him what it means. Okay? Not Qatada. Response number four, Shaykh Ali ibn Naif al-Shahud further states that this narration of Qatada is not explained in detail. Even this narration is a little bit funny. It's not explicit. And then if it's taken back to the other narrations, which unlike this one are authentic, this one's not authentic. In the Qatada statement, when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yuhibbu an yutalliqaha wa yakshim aqat al-nas. Again, in Arabic it says, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa likes, wishes to, to, to divorce her, but he fears the sins of the people. What does the Qatada say at the top? Um, he says, in order that he eventually can, uh, sorry, was the desire that Zayd divorced him, in order that he eventually can marry. Where does it say that in the Arabic version? So this includes the word yuhib, meaning to wish or to desire something. Meaning that the Prophet ﷺ knew that Zayd would divorce Zainab from a previous revelation from Allah, and thus the fear of what the people would say is that he married the ex-wife of his adopted son. This is not Wasim Ismail speaking from London, Ontario, Canada. This is Shaykh Ali ibn Naif al-Shahud. Okay, these are big scholars. And he wrote a whole book called Al-Mufassal for Raddi al-Shubhati Adal Islam, the detailed response and answer in the doubts of the enemies of Islam. So these Orientalists that Eskhar is saying, oh, you know, they're saying Orientalists got this. No, they got it from our books. Yeah, they got it from our books. But is everything in the history books of the Muslims and in the Hadith books authentic? When you go back in the earlier history, is it all authentic? I'll give you an example right now, just to take a little break from this. Okay, and I'll get to this in a second. Sahih al-Bukhari. Somebody can come and say, hey, uh, in Sahih Bukhari, don't you Muslims say that uh, it's the most authentic book after the Quran? Yes, of course, we believe in that. This is part of our creed. Well, you know, it says in Sahih Bukhari that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam attempted to commit suicide. What do you say to that? For those who don't know, Sahih Bukhari has compiled a hadith according to his terms. Okay? Of authenticity. But in Sahih al-Bukhari, in the book, along with it, he narrates 
what others have said. So Imam al-Zuhri, for example, who's one of the junior, the juniors of at tabiun one of the junior uh, successors, he said, it has reached us that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tried to commit suicide. What kind of chain is that? Just because Al-Bukhari included some things in his, in his book, along with his book, it, in reality, it's not part of Bukhari because it does not satisfy his conditions of authenticity. That's the answer to that. But again, if somebody doesn't know, oh my God, it's in Bukhari, oh, we're in trouble now. No, we're not in trouble. So one has to be very careful. Yes, the Qadi then goes on to say, hey, Ibn al-Jawzi says there are four opinions. Yes, the Qadi tells us that there are four opinions that summarized by Ibn al-Jawzi in his Zad al-Masir, fi ilm al-Tafsir. So Ibn al-Jawzi says there are four opinions. Number one, Ibn Abbas said it was his love for her. We said that that's got no, no, no chain of friendship. Uh, just throw that out. That's not even authentic. And then number two, Ali ibn al-Hussein from al-Hassan al-Basri, the grandson of uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, said it was the promise from Allah that he would eventually marry her. Knowledge, he would marry her. In blue, I put that for you. Fine. Qatada, Muqatan ibn Jaraj. I just talked about Qatada right now. He wished that Zayd would divorce her. He, he quoted him right this time. I got to give him credit. Not so he can eventually marry her. Number four, Ibn, Ibn uh, Zayd, another tabi'un said that he was, that what he had was the intention that if Zayd divorced her, he would eventually marry. Okay. We already said that number one, Ibn Abbas, the number one is, is out because there is no chain of transmission to even prove that Ibn Abbas said this. Number three, Qatada, we, we, we put that away because of, it was, he, he gave a morsel, you know, uh, missing links in the chain. And even if the chain is right, he narrates heresies sometimes and, 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 and inauthentic things. And then the number four, uh, the intention that if they divorced her, he would eventually marry her. You know what? Yes, the Qadid, what does it tell us about all this? He goes, one, three, and four are the exact same. And number two stands out. So Ibn Abbas, he said, his love for her. Qadhada said, he wished that they would divorce her. And, and the th number four says, the intention that if they divorced her, he would eventually marry her. All these are the same because he had this in his heart, he, his love for her, which is the same as him, uh, you know, um, uh, wishing that, that they would divorce her so that he eventually marries her. One, three, and four, he says, are the same. I say, no, they're not the same. We already said that one is inauthentic, and even number three is unauthentic. Number four, I didn't check into it, but let's say it is authentic. I say numbers two, three, and four are the ones that are the same, and number one is the one that stands out, which absolutely doesn't even fit the narrative, period. Number one has no chain, as I mentioned, Ibn Abbas, there's no chain in Al-Baghawi. They didn't even mention where it came from, and it has been shown that all narrations to this effect are unreliable, Two, three, and four can be clearly attributed to the knowledge of the Prophet. So, from Prophet, number two says, knowledge that he would marry her. We could say that, yeah, because he knows he's going to marry her, and Allah promised this, it's going to happen. He wishes they would divorce her, even though I told him, hold on, keep her, fear Allah, and keep her. And that the intention is that once they divorce her, he wouldn't eventually marry her, because he knows from before. Prophet had the revelation from this. Okay, so, you know, this is again, yes, the Qadi's. Um, you know, understanding. And unfortunately, like it does not fit the narrative at all. Now, bear with me. I know this is taking a little bit longer than I expected, but inshallah, it's going to be worth it. Um, and I'm not trying to fill time, believe me. I'm just trying to be very, very clear so that those who uh, tune in later and want to watch this again can understand. Was there such a thing as version A, brothers and sisters? Did it even exist? Adwa'u al-bayan. This is a book by Sheikh Muhammad, uh, you know, a six volume tafsir by Sheikh Muhammad al Shankiti, volume four, pages 285 to 287. I, I spent a lot of time pulling these references and translating them to make sure that we're all clear on this one. I don't just talk from my head, you know, I bring references. The translation of what this book, uh, the, this tafsir is, the best translation I could, I could come up with is the shining eloquence of clarifying what? The Quran with what? With ambiguous narrations that have no foundation? No, with the Quran. The Quran clarifies the Quran before anything else. And the hadith supports, and sometimes the hadith will clarify the Quran, but the Quran doesn't clarify the Quran. It's there. And then the companion statements, and then the tabi'un, if they're authentic, and then the Arabic language. Well, this is what the scholars have taught us, our teachers. What does Sheikh Muhammad Shaqiti say? You might want to uh, increase the size of your screen. Allah's statement. While you concealed within yourself that which was Allah is to disclose. What was hidden was the Prophet ﷺ concealed and which Allah disclosed, and that is the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ to Zainab bin Tujahsh. May Allah be pleased with her. Because Allah had revealed that to him previously, and during that time she was under Zayd ibn Haritha. She was still his wife. She was still Zayd's wife. 
because his that is the prophet's word sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet sallallahu marriage to her is what allah disclosed due to his saying so when zaid had no longer any need for her we married her to you now we told the people that you love her we married her to you and that is the actualization of the meaning from which allah which the quran has indicated and that is what is appropriate for his status meaning the status of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because the Quran already explains that and says that. And from this, you know, listen to this now, that what many explainers of the Quran stated and, and, and that what he hid within himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and what Allah has disclosed is Zainab's falling into his heart and his love for her when she was under Zaid, and that she heard him when he said, exalted is the one who turns the hearts, you know, when he was, since Allah was saying, oh, he turned away and he was mumbling something and Subhanahu maqalib al qulub to the end of the story, all of it is what? Unsanitized? No. Inauthentic. And the evidence for that is that Allah did not disclose any such thing. Allah didn't say, oh, we, 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 we revealed your love to her. No, we revealed that you're going to marry her in order that people later on don't, uh, are not stuck in this old tradition of the Arabs where, oh, you, your adopted son, if he divorces, you can't marry because he's not your biological son. Even though we clearly said that he will disclose what the Prophet ﷺ had concealed. Al-Qurtubi said that the story is unauthentic. This is all, by the way, coming from the same tafsir, which is in Arabic, by the way. Al-Qurtubi also referenced the same thing from Ali ibn Hussain, the grandson of Ali, Nabi Talib, may Allah pleased with him, who said that Allah had revealed to his Prophet, Allah's praise and peace be upon him, that Zayd will divorce Zainab and that Allah will marry her to his Prophet ﷺ. He also stated that this saying is the best of what was, what was said of the meaning of this verse. And that is what the critical researchers are upon and the great scholars who are grounded and firm in knowledge, such as Zuhri, Al-Qadi Bakr ibn, ibn Al-Ala, al Al-Qushayri, and Al-Qadi Abu Bakr ibn Al-Arabi and others. So yes, Al-Qadi is on one side and these scholars are on the other side. Al-Qurtubi then concluded that the story which was narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu loved Zainab, the wife of Zayd, which some, with some insolent individuals, even throwing terms like intense passionate love, then this comes from those who are ignorant of the infallibility of the Prophet ﷺ from such a thing or from one who belittles his inviability and sanctity. People have no respect for Prophet ﷺ. They go and they search for these tabloids and myth narrations to fit the narrative that they feel is right. What does Ibn Kathir say? Ibn Kathir said, Ibn Abi Hatim and Ibn Jair had mentioned some narrations from the predecessors. May Allah be pleased with them. We wish to disregard them due to their inauthenticity. Then they refer to the statements of Ali ibn Hussein that Al Qutbi mentioned. What did the Asal Qadi say about Ibn Kathir? The greatest professor, you know, of medieval Islam. I just love that word medieval. He keeps on talking about medieval Islam, medieval as if it's like some, some dark ages backward Islam. Allah Mustaan. He stated that Ibn Kathir is the, the greatest professor, explainer of the Quran, of medieval Islam, doesn't even have version A. Yes, the Qari also said that Ibn Hajar says some early books mention stories that it's better not to even mention them. Wait a minute. Ibn Kathir told you why he didn't include it. Because it's not authentic. He didn't just not put it in there. And then what did Ibn Hajar say? You say Ibn Hajar said that there are some stories, it's better not to even mention them. What did Ibn Hajar really say? He said, don't busy yourself with these, some of these statements. Ibn Hajar said, don't busy yourself with them. He knows about them. Given by some explainers of the Quran, such as Ibn Abi Hatim, Al Tabari, and Qatada, he mentioned them after Ibn Hajar provided the authentic ones. This is Ibn Hajar in his Fath al Bari, which is translated to the Victory of the Creator, volume 8 in Arabic, pages 664 to 666. So it's about authenticity. It's not about them just leaving it because, oh, it's, we're too shy to mention it. We just showed that these narrations are all bogus. Continuing on, brothers and sisters, inshallah, the rest, hopefully we can race through it and finish it. Now, this is the one where Allah Musta'an, did Ibn al-Qayyim support version A? Because everybody's like, oh, you know, Ibn al-Qayyim, he said this, the student of Ibn Taymiyyah, how are they? What does, Ibn, what does Yasir Qadi say? That's why you have always some intellectual giants, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn al-Qayyim are always those who are willing to go against the flow. Go back to the original and be very clear. And Ibn Qayyim is one of those who had no problems going back to the original and telling it like it is. Ibn Qayyim is obviously Ibn Taymiyyah's main student and died 758. He has this famous book, ad da wa dawa okay, which translates to the disease and the cure. And this is a book all about love and the problems of love and the cure for haram love. The whole book is about love between, so love, it's like lustful love, the lustful love. And then he says, Yasir Qadi, Ibn Qayyim mentions 
he has a long chapter regarding the dangers of haram love. And then he follows this by mentioning the blessings of permissibility and permissibility of the other types of love. Okay. Then he mentions that the Prophet Sallallahu saw Zainab and said, Subhana Mukhalib al Qulub. Ibn Qayyim said this in his book. Yes, what it's, yes, okay, fine. So it's going back to version A, which now has been mentioned, has not been mentioned by Ibn Kathir. No, Ibn Kathir mentioned it and said it's unauthentic. But of course, Ibn Al Qayyim is going back and that after Zayd divorced her, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala himself married her to the Prophet. Sallam. So in the chapter of halal and permissible love, he mentions the story that we just mentioned. Okay, this is Ibn Al Qayyim. This is Ibn Al Qayyim doing this. So what is Yas al Qadi saying? He says that in the chapter of halal and permissible love, in the book, the disease and the cure, Ibn al-Qayyim is mentioning this. Okay, let's find out if that's true or not. Here you go, ladies and gentlemen, right in front of you. Yeah, it was mentioned in that book. Version A was mentioned about the Prophet um, you know, having love or something in his heart. Yeah, when he says, all right, it was mentioned on page 528 of his book, The Disease and the Cure. It was mentioned in the context of Ibn al-Qayyim discussing the views of those who oppose, who oppose, a third time, who oppose his arguments about the harms of deep passionate love. So for those who even understand Arabic and even can give an effort to even look into the context, Ibn al-Qayyim and Ibn Ta yes, yes, you're right, they go against the flow. You know why they go against the flow? Because they, this is something that they stand out with. They mentioned the arguments of the opposite of the objectors, the ones who are on the opposite side of the fence, and then they follow it up with refutation. So they don't just give their opinion, they talk about the opinion of the ones who oppose them and the refutation on top of that. So Ibn Qayyim mentioned this story in the context of the arguments of those who oppose him. Let's find out more. It says, and I've, and I've got it here on the screen, you can see uh, I have it uh, 528 there in the, uh, in the Hindi numbers, okay? وهذا سيد الأولين والآخرين ورسول رب العالمين نظر إلى زينب بنت جحش فقال سبحان مقلب القلوب to the end it says in, in English I'm going to translate this for you and here is the master of the first and the last of creation and the messenger of the Lord of the worlds he saw Zainab bint Jahsh and said exalted is the turner of hearts now right beside that phrase is a footnote too it shows two things number one the inauthenticity of the story. And again, if, for those who can read Arabic, it talks about uh, Ibn Sa'ad and it talks about the others who took from him, from him, okay? And something else. In the green border there, it makes reference to Ibn Al-Qayyim's Zad Al-Ma'ad, a book that apparently, if I'm not wrong, he wrote after Ad-Dawah Dawa, after this book, okay? Anyway. The quote goes on to say, and she was under Zayd ibn Haratha, his freed slave. So when the latter wanted to divorce her, that is Zayd, the Prophet Sallallahu said to him, fear Allah and keep your... Okay. So it's in the book. No problem. But how is it in the book? It's on page what, guys? 528. Next slide. I've taken the liberty to go into the index of this book, at that with Dawa. Okay? And I'm... And I took the index and I'm showing you exactly where this phrase was, what pages and under what headings. The previous quote from Ibn al-Qayyim's book, ad da with dawa was from page 528, as we've already mentioned. Fine. Dr. Yasser Qadi claimed that what? In the chapter of halal and permissible love. So there's a chapter on halal and permissible love. Okay. He mentions the story that we just mentioned. So in other words, Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned the story in the chapter on permissible love according to Yasser Qadi. Is that where it was mentioned? The chapter on permissible love. Let us take a look at the index of the book to see the full story in its reality. Below, we will present four images from the index of the book. There's going to be a total of four images. These are the first two on the screen to find out the, the full story. Below, we will present four images, starting with the title on page 413. On page 14 of the book, Fasl, Ilaj al Chapter on page 413. Two cures for lustful or passionate or deep love, whatever you want to translate it as. I'm using lustful because Yasir al Qadi used the term lust. Fine, we'll use the same term, Yasir al Qadi, no problem. So, Ibn al Qayyim on page 413. Again, that where was that story, brothers and sisters? Pay attention with me. It was on page 528. I'm taking a little bit back to show you the context of this. Okay, page 413. Ibn al Qayyim is talking about two cures for lustful love. The first one in Arabic, I have it circled in blue. Al-awwal, 
الطريق المانع من حصوله وهو أمران. He says the first cure from this lustful love being stuck in it. He said that the way to block it. And then he's and then and then he gives two ways. I didn't write that in English because there was no space. But there you could see one and two there for those of us who are, uh, you know, even even the people in the subcontinent, my brothers and sisters from there, whom I really respect. Um, you could see one and two uh, there. Okay. First, the way to block it, and wahua amran. There are two ways. Which ones are they? On page four fifteen, lowering the gaze. May Allah give us the the, the 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 strength to do that. It's not easy for us guys to be doing that, but it, but we have to do it. Lowering the gaze and its benefits. What are the benefits? basari That's number one, right? So under the first way, it says the way to block it. Like I said, How do you prevent it from coming into your heart in the first place? Preventative medicine. How do you prevent the disease from happening? He says the first of the two things under that first category, lower your gaze on page 422. اشتغال القلب بما يصده عن ذلك Busying the heart with what averts it from that So number one, lower your gaze And number two, in order that this doesn't get into your heart The wrong, lustful, evil type of love How do you busy yourself from falling into that trap Of that lustful love which you're stuck to So Ibn Qayyim begins by discussing the cures for lustful love First by blocking it from entering one's heart in the first place Which I termed as preventative medicine the second way Ibn al-Qayyim discusses is for the one who became afflicted. So the one who didn't lower his gaze, didn't distract himself from these things, it's gotten into his heart. He starts talking about that on page 482. Second, the way to cure lustful love. So I'm telling you how not to let it, I'm telling you how to prevent the, the, the disease from happening. Lower your gaze, busy your heart with other things that are good things. And if for some reason you slip and you don't do that and it enters your heart, right? Second way to cure lustful love, he talks about then the immediate and long-term harms of lustful love, he talks about Yusuf's trial from the wife of Al-Aziz, and you know, he, he gives these kinds of uh, uh, information, right? Where page are we on so far? Page 482, right? This is the second image down here. And the story is on page what? 528, about the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi seeing Zainab and seeing Subhanahu Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? We're not there yet, let's continue. Next slide. And I promise you this is going to be quick, inshallah, at the end now. Just be patient with me and bear with me. Now we jump to page 508. 508, right? Because the story that Yasir Qadi mentions is 528. We're getting there. 508. Ibn al-Qayyim illustrates the arguments of those who object to his points. So he's telling you, first of all, how to prevent lustful love from entering your heart. And if it does enter, what do you do to get rid of it? And then some people are saying, no, no, but lustful love has its benefits and, you know, this and that. And maybe I think I could be wrong. Maybe he's responding to the Sufis. I think, maybe. I didn't read the book entirely. I don't, I've just looked at, glanced at it. Then on page 508, Ibn al-Qayyim illustrates the arguments of those who object to his points. So he's presenting the opposite side of the fence. So those who say, no, but this and that. Ibn al-Qayyim brings the stories of passionate lovers, which his opponents bring forth. Starting on page 512, and ending on page what? 531. From page 512 to page 531. Where's that story, guys? For those who are paying attention, I'm looking at the comments. Where's that story? The story is where? It's on page 528. The one that Yasir Qadi is telling us is in Ibn al-Qayyim's book. Okay. So Ibn al-Qayyim brings the stories. So version A, which Ibn al is obsessed with, is mentioned by Ibn al-Qayyim in the context of the arguments of his opponents. As shown earlier, the story is on page 528, which falls between 512 and 531. Just before Ibn al-Qayyim, pay attention, goes back to refute his opponents. Look at the index. I have it here for you on the screen, guys and ladies. Page 508, objections on the author by mention of benefits of lustful love. Those who object, page 508, and then they, the, those who object bring stories of passionate lovers on page 512, okay? And then on page 532, Ibn Qayyim says, okay, is this what you've got? I'm gonna refute you now. On what page? 532, which means that that story of Muhammad seeing Zainab and saying, Subhanahu wa sallam al he was quoting it from those who oppose him, not from himself, not from himself. This was not Ibn Qayyim, meaning that forget about the next thing we're gonna get into. 
Forget about what Ibn Qayyim says in Zad al-Ma'ad, which I'll get into in a second. In the same book, Adda'ud Dawa Ibn Qayyim does not agree with that story. Look what he says in the next slide. After answering the objections, Ibn Qayyim on page 552 dis discusses the natural love that men have for women and that it is not blameworthy. Within Ibn Qayyim's discussion, he brings on page 554, this is after that story where he mentions those who oppose him, right? He brings that story that he believes is right. Okay, within Ibn Qayyim's discussion, he brings on page 554 the story of Zainab bin Tujah from his perspective, not from the perspective of those who oppose him and say, but look at these other stories of love. You know, there's, there's, there's benefits in that kind of lustful love. The one which Yasir Qadi is calling version B, the one he doesn't like and thinks, oh, you know, it's, it's sanitized. Here's the screenshot, final one. Chapter, page 552, the love of women, Muhabbat al Niswan. And then 554, Qissatu Zainab bin Tujahsh al Sahih, the correct story of Zainab bin Tujahsh. The correct story. What does Ibn al Qayyim say? The next image is exactly what Ibn al Qayyim stated, starting on page 554, and then page 555 will come. Again, as a recap, page 528, when he showed that, that story about the Prophet ﷺ saying, Subhanahu wa Sallam, you saw Zainab and he, you know, something entered his heart and all that. Ibn al Qayyim was mentioning this in the context of those who oppose him. If I have a basic understanding of Arabic, you would know that. Now, here on page 554, I'm going to save time by translating, but the Arabic is there. From the book of Dawah, the diseases and the cure. As for the story of Zainab bin Tujahsh, now this is Ibn al-Qayyim speaking. Not him quoting his opponents who say that lustful love has benefits. This is Ibn al-Qayyim speaking. As for the story of Zainab bin Tujahsh, then Zayd was determined to divorce her and she was not compatible with him. And he, Zayd, used to consult the Prophet وسلم, regarding uh, Zayd, you know, parting with her. And he, the Prophet وسلم, ordered him to keep her. And then what does Ibn al-Qayyim say? The Prophet وسلم, knew that Zayd would definitely part with her. So he kept this to himself that if Zayd parted with her, then he would that he would marry her. And that he, the Prophet وسلم, feared people saying that the Prophet married what? The ex-wives of his son. This is what he feared that it was going to become manifest because he had adopted Zayd before the prophethood and the Lord, the transcendent, wants to legislate a general legislation for the well-being of his slaves. So when Zayd divorced her and her wedding period was over, he, the Prophet وسلم, sent Zayd to ask for her in marriage for himself. That is the Prophet وسلم. So Zayd came and he kept his back to the door and, and, and she became elevated and great in his heart, in his chest, due to the messenger of Allah mentioning her. So Zayd looked at her in a, in a, in a, in a very high status. So Zayd called her from behind the door saying, O Zainab, the messenger of Allah sends a marriage proposal. So she said, I will not do anything until I consult my Lord. She got up in her, to her private chamber, al-mihrab, and prayed. So Allah the Mighty and the Majestic personally took care of her marriage to the messenger and he did the marriage contract from above his throne, above seven heavens. And the revelation came with that. So when Zayd had no longer any need for her, we married her to you. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam subsequently got up and entered upon her. So she, Zainab, used to take pride on the other women, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam due to that. And she would say, you were given in marriage by your families while Allah has given marriage from above seven heavens. So this is the story of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Zainab. This is the story that Ibn Qayyim endorses and believes it's correct. So what does Yasir Qadi just take a part of his book in which he quotes the story from those who oppose him as if he said it, and then he doesn't even bring this. So forget about the next slide now. We're gonna end this off really soon. Very soon, inshallah, be patient with me. For those who are staying up, I'm very sorry about this, keeping you up like this, but inshallah there's benefit in this. The next part now makes the mention of Zad al-Ma'ad which translates to the provisions for the afterlife, the appointed time. An important part of being academically honest is to present all of the statements of the scholars because it is not abnormal for a scholar to change a position previously taken due to finding authentic narrations to support it. Now, this is Wasim speaking, okay? This is not Ibn al-Qayyim. It was clearly found that even Ibn al-Qayyim's book that is using the cure, we just saw his position was not version A, that Prophet was hiding his love for Zainab, whereas he presented it as part of the arguments of those who oppose his arguments. Furthermore, in the very same book, in his rebuttal to the objectors, Ibn al-Qayyim gave his understanding of the story, which is what Nasir Qadi calls uh, 
you know, version B. Yasser yeah, so Qadi took a statement from Ibn Qayyim's book out of context and did not even present all of what was in the book on the topic at hand. What makes matters even worse is that Ibn Al Qayyim, in his other work, Zad al Ma'ad, attacked and criticized version A and its proponents. Screenshot of the original Arabic is on the screen, pages 266 to 267 of volume four are there for those who can read Arabic, but let's just cut the chase and go right to the point. The book that we find that Dar al may Allah uh, bless them and reward them, have called Healing the Medicine, Healing with the Medicine of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by Ibn Qayyim is actually part of his book, Zad al Ma'ad. So they took part of his book and the majority of that they've compiled in here to make it easier for people to read. This book, starting on page 289, when, when uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is talking about the, you know, the cure for lustful love. What does Ibn Al Qayyim say? The one that says, oh, see, Ibn Al Qayyim said it in his book, you know, we show that even that with the way Ibn Al Qayyim, that's not what he, what he believed. You know, he gave what he understood in his after his rebuttal to those who gave, gave the other version of the story. What does Ibn Al Qayyim say? We're almost done. There is a false claim that was started by those who do not give the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam his due respect and appreciation. Stating that the Prophet ﷺ once saw Zainab bin Tajahsh and said, All praise be he who changes the hearts as he will, Subhana Masarrif al Qulub. And said, uh, They also claimed that the Prophet ﷺ was inflicted with, the, with, with this disease, passion, and that his heart liked her. Yet they claimed he commanded Zayd to keep her and not divorce her until Allah revealed the verse, uh, which, which we've, we've read many, many times, Alhamdulillah, um, which I'll leave for you. And the editor's note here, it says, and this is, you know, the editor of the book in English says, this is referring to before the prophet was married to Zainab, um, okay? She was at the time still married to Zainab bint Haritha. Therefore, it is unimaginable and impossible that the prophet sallallahu would lust for the wife of another man. If she was married, then he's lusting. Like, would you even accept that for your own father? You know? Abd al-Qayyim continues. Now this is, this was on page 289, brothers and sisters. Now page 290, we're almost done. Bear with me, I'm sorry. Those who uttered this false claim also claim that this that the ayah is talking about passion. Consequently, some of them collected a book about passion in which they mentioned several prophets who were afflicted with this disease, including the Prophet. This is an utter ignorance of such people of the Quran and the messengers, and a an misunderstanding that alters the true meaning of Allah's words. Further, this false claim accuses the Prophet with what he is truly innocent of. This is Ibn al-Qayyim, Dr. Yasser Qadi speaking. This is not me talking. This is not sanitization. This is a fact. This is the real story. What you're bringing forth is like going on the checkout aisle in a grocery store and the tablets about this actor and that actor, you know, oh, they're in love with this because we saw them beside them. And you don't talk about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like that. Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu, whom the Prophet had adopted before Islam until he was called Zayd ibn Muhammad, married Zainab bin Tujahsh. Zainab was not humble with her husband. Like I said, she had a sharp tongue. May Allah be pleased with her. But she immediately, uh, um, you know, Aisha used to speak really, really well of her. She, 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 she felt that Zainab was the one that really competed with her, was very close to competition to her. And um, except that she had a sharp tongue, but she would immediately, you know, um, apologize and, 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 uh, and feel regretful. So Zainab was not humble with her husband. And, and he asked the prophets the advice if he should divorce her. The messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Keep your, your wife to yourself and fear Allah. And then on page 90, the Prophet ﷺ thought that if Zayd would otherwise divorce her, he would marry her after him. But the Prophet ﷺ hid this thought in his head heart because he knew from Allah, because he feared what the people might say if he married the ex-wife of his adopted son. This is why Allah mentioned in this ayah his favors on the Prophet and commanded him to fear what the people might, what not uh, him not to not to fear, sorry, what the people might say in doing what Allah has allowed for him. Um, Allah then has also reminded him that uh, it is he whom the Prophet ﷺ should fear. He should fear Allah and the people. So he should not be hesitant in doing what Allah has allowed for him because of fear of what the people might say. This is Ibn Al-Qayyim talking. Further, Allah informed the Prophet ﷺ that he, was, he has given Zainab to him in marriage after Zayd anhu had divorced her so that, why? To, to, to reveal that Muhammad loved her, you know, was something in his heart. No. So that his nation imitates him when they know that the man is allowed to marry the ex-wife of his adopted son, this is what Allah in Surah Al-Nisa says, أَصْلَابِكُمْ And the wives of your sons who spring from your own loins are forbidden for you to marry. Biological sons. And in this chapter, in Surah Al-Nisa, the chapter, the woman, chapter 4, verse 40, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ 
Muhammad is not the father of any of your men. Okay? I mean, so that, you know, he, he wasn't the father. This was an adopted son. So, you know, he can marry the ex-wife of his adopted son. Um, and then while in the beginning of the chapter, Allah said, Never has he made your adopted sons your real sons. That is, but, um, you know, you're, you're saying with your, with your mouths. And then Ibn al-Qayyim concludes by saying, therefore, Dr. Yasser Qadi and anybody else who, 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 who runs their mouth the way, the, the way he did, think deeply about Allah's defense of the Prophet Sallallahu that refuted the false accusation directed at him. All success comes from Allah, indeed it does. Now, we're gonna summarize, but the sisters, we're done. Just a couple of slides left. Yasser yes, Qadi's references, for those who are following, inshallah, this will really help wrap it up. Um, all of the following are unreliable. And when I, I said here, all, of the, all, all three of the following are unreliable. I mean, I was talking about the narrations. Um, number four is the Tamin of Ibn Abbas, which is not even a narration to begin with. But anyway, narration in Musad Ahmad, the, narr the narrator Mu'amal ibn Ismail is unreliable and out of the nine students of Ahmad ibn Zaid, he narrates an odd narration different from the other eight, he even doubts himself in his own narration. This is a summary of what we talked about. Number two, narration of Ibn Sa'd and his biographies. All narrators are unreliable. The narrator on top of the chain, that is Muhammad ibn Yahya ibn Habban, not Habban, Habban, is only quoted to have said it. It is not mentioned from whom he heard it. He just said it. We don't know. And, and we said that the, 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 one of them is Matruk, the one that Ibn Sa'ad took from is abandoned completely. So those who speak about, who mention hadiths and lie are Matruk, like completely abandoned. And the third narration of Abdul Razak al-Sana'ani back to Qatada, Qatada is not reliable and even his words are unclear and can be interpreted in different ways. Whereas that's what Qadi added in so he can marry her. Qadada said you can marry her. Qatada didn't say that, even if it was authentic. And number five, Yasu Qadi misquoted al-Baghawi by claiming that al-Baghawi gave the tafsir of version B. You know, version B is the one that he doesn't like, yes, Qadi, and doesn't think is the right one because it sounded better, meaning that Muhammad had the knowledge. This is what he knew. This is what Allah subhanahu wa was going to reveal. And not because it fits the Quran. Not because it fits the Quran. Whereas this explanation in al-Baghawi's tafsir was given by Ali ibn al-Husayn ibn Abi Talib and Hassan al-Basri al al very early on. So al-Baghawi quoted those who lived 450 years before him, okay? And showed that this is the proper understanding and that's the tafsir of the verses. And Al-Baghawi actually said that it fits the Quranic narrative, whereas al Qadi said, no, no, Al-Baghawi said it because it doesn't, not because it fits the Quranic narrative, but because, you know, it just sounds better. So let's do it. Ibn Al-Qayyim statements are evidence against Yas Al-Qadi, not for him. So not only are there lies against Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Zainab bin Tajahsh and that whole thing, but even the scholars are being lied upon. And I'm not as afraid of meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on, on Yawm al-Qiyamah with what I've said today. And I look forward to Allah's judgment on this one. And I end with this. Important warnings to my dear brothers and sisters. May Allah reward you for staying. And if you have to leave and go to sleep, go ahead. This will be on YouTube, inshallah. And um, uh, you know anybody who wants those PowerPoint slides, I will send them to you. Just contact me and I'll send them to you gladly, inshallah. Yasir Qadi, by his own, and, and this is, by the way, in the lecture, this is, this is a big red flag, guys. Yasir Qadi, by his own admission, does the same technique that he did with the story of Zainab bin Tajash and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa does this with other stories in the seerah. One of my close mentors told me that he caught Yasir Qadi also talking about Hassan ibn Thabit in the, in the Battle of Al-Ahzab, in the Battle of... Uh, the Confederates, and that basically uh, the scholars, the early scholars of the medieval scholars, um, you know, um, they were in agreement that Hassan the Thabit was a coward, and he did not want to fight the, you know, the the people that were fighting the Muslims at the time, and he and and, and I guess women uh, are the ones that ended up fighting instead of him or something, and that the scholars later on sanitized the story and made Hassan the Thabit look like his rave, even though there were scholars from back then, the medieval scholars, if you want to call them that that have proven that this is bogus as well. So he does the same thing with the seerah. So for those who say to me, Brother Wasim, uh, are we, can we listen to his seerah series? No, don't listen to it. Don't listen to it. In fact, I would say don't listen to anything from him, period. And I'll explain why. His efforts to clarify doubts 
only create more doubts. He's saying, you know, if we don't tell our, our young people the truth, then they're going to find out the truth the hard way, and then they're going to leave Islam. So his efforts to clarify doubts, actually, they're doing the opposite. They create more doubts. And they're, in fact, the ones which are dangerous for young Muslims. His approach is dangerous. I stated this recently about the Quran and the preservation of the Quran. I mean, you know, and the doubts he has about the preservation and, and how it doesn't fit the historical narrative. And I mean, Allah, Allah knows best. This is the next point now. His obsession with historicizing, quote unquote, matters drives him to strange conclusions. On the contrary, and I say this, looking at history means scholars who came later on were able to authenticate what earlier scholars were otherwise unable to authenticate. The early scholars were concerned with compiling information, bringing it, okay? And presenting it to the public so that, we, that, that, that they have it. It's there, part of, part of the heritage of the Muslims. But, then, but they weren't concerned about authenticating. There were a lot of fabrications and things that were, they were, they were gathered and they were put in these books. But scholars, if you want to talk about historicizing, the scholars that came later had the advantage of looking at history behind them and saying, okay, now here's everything that was compiled. Let's clean it up. Imam al-Bukhari, for example, was the student of Imam Ahmad. Imam Ahmad has the biggest, if I'm not wrong, the biggest compilation of hadith. I think it's like 30 or 40,000 hadith, if I'm not wrong. Imam al-Bukhari was one of Imam Ahmad's students. And Imam Bukhari's compilation is more authentic than Imam Ahmad. Imam Bukhari came after, right? And he was one of his students. Third or fourth point. Yasir Qadi even goes as far as to claim that the development of ideas, again, this is part of historicizing, affects all aspects of Islam, be it sira fiqh, even aqidah. Wow. So aqidah, we don't have a solid aqidah as Muslims. It's just, it's open to interpretation. You know, ash'ari, maturidi, athari, whatever you want, you know, it's all good. And he mentioned this in another video on that one podcast, which I have on my YouTube channel and here on Facebook as well, where he's saying, yeah, just like fiqh, you know, study whatever you want and you know, any strand and just, you know, study because there's human elements in it. Human elements in it. How did the Quran come to us? Was it not through human beings? Did Jibreel come to me and give me the Quran in my hands now? Or did it come through the chains of transmission from human beings? The same way the Hadith came as well, you know? So, Aqidah, the queen of the Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes, Allah will always be the way he is and he's not going to change because someone else interpreted it differently. We go back to the Salaf, the, the, the predecessors. Yes, al Qadi claims that we are to study in academic detail if we are qualified. Whereas even with his level of study, I say, he proved to be, and I'm sorry to say this, and no, I'm not sorry to say this, he proved to be academically dishonest. We saw this in today's presentation, and this has been proven in this presentation. It was evident in other positions he held more recently, you know, the Gog and Magog, Yuj and Majuj, talking about zombies and all these kinds of weird things, and bringing, you know, opinions of even Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Saadi and trying to say, see, he had an opinion. But none of these opinions support your narrative, Yasir Qadi, and what you, what you say. And it will be very clear as more of his methods become disclosed. You just watch, you just watch as days pass, you know, when you're at that level, you're above criticism, no one's gonna listen. Uh, he's not gonna listen, or anyone in this stature is not gonna listen to some little guy like me. This shows the importance, brothers and sisters, of not blindly following personalities in the religion of Islam. If your heart tells you something is up, says that doesn't make sense, People must investigate matters and ask others who have the same or more knowledge. Don't just be spoon-fed and be sheep and take whatever somebody throws at you. You don't do that. This is your religion. The truth is not measured by men. It is the other way around. Celebrity speakers and being famous and having many followers on social media does not mean that this person is upon the truth. Maybe you benefited from him or others. That's great. We're not taking that away. But unless somebody was able to go through this and spend the time, that lecture is up there. It's got 20,000 plus views. Another one, I think back from 2013 has 60 or 70,000 views of the same topic. Any so-called scholar or speaker who undermines the importance of Aqidah, this is, and the people ask me like, who should I listen to? Who should I listen to? I, I can't tell. I can, any so-called scholar or speaker who undermines the importance of Aqidah, you know, he, Yusuf Qadi, once in a, uh, one of the lectures, uh, called Bridging the Ash'ari and Athari Divide or something like that. It's on YouTube, by the way. It's like, oh, the Salafis, you know, they just beat Aqidah to death. They keep beating it to death. This is what he said. Any so-called scholar or speaker who undermines the importance of Aqidah should not be followed. You know, Hamza Yusuf, for example, has been, has said that uh, people, the studying of Aqidah has become a disease for the Muslims. Another place, Hamza Yusuf said, you can study Aqidah in 10 minutes. Even Yasir Qadi, by the way, used to criticize him for that statement. Now he's, he's okay with it. So any so-called scholar or speaker who undermines the importance of Aqidah should not be followed. 
and not just any aqidah, only the aqidah of the Salaf, the pious predecessors. And when I say pious predecessors, I'm talking about those blessed generations, not about those who label themselves Salafi today and have turned it into a group, not much different than the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood or Hizb al-Tahrir or whatever, you know, don't, they fell to the same trap and Sheikh Uthameen already spoke against those. those they said that, he said that group of what they call themselves Salafis back when he was alive, may Allah have mercy on him. Uh, they're the closest to the truth, but they still fell the same trap of Hizbiyyah or bigoted partisanship. Brothers and sisters, I'll end off with this. The importance of learning Arabic. And I'm gonna speak on my own behalf, the little guy that I am, that I'm learning the religion and I'm taking it steps, it's a little bit of a step here and there at a time. If I did not know Arabic and I could not read and understand Arabic, there is no way I could have done what I was, was able to do today. There's always um, an incentive to learn Arabic. If you wanna, I'm not saying you're not, you're, not, you're not gonna be a good Muslim unless you know Arabic. I'm saying if you wanna go deep and have more knowledge and, and access that great knowledge, you must learn Arabic or make an effort to learn Arabic. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all with good for your patience in watching the presentation today. I know I've taken a long time and I'm sorry. I, I expected to finish in about an hour, but Qaddar Allah wa ma sha'a fa'al. Subhanak Allah wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Sallallahu alayhi wa